The following interview is part of the USMC Vietnam Tankers Association History Project. The interview is being conducted at the VTA reunion in St. Louis, Missouri, September 24, 2017. Interviewees are members of the VTA. The purpose of the History Project and the interviews is to capture the experiences of our Vietnam veterans and make them available for future generations. My name is Ed Boyette. I was Charlie Company 1st Tank, 2nd Platoon. I was in Vietnam from November 66 to December 67. Great. Thanks, Ed. Great. Rick Lewis. Uh, first Sergeant retired. Uh, I served with Charlie Company First Tanks from I think it's March 1966 all the way till December 67. Uh, I extended uh, for two full years. Okay. Greg? Uh, Greg Alclair, retired First Sergeant, uh, was uh, with Charlie Company First Tank Battalion, 2nd Platoon, um, 66 to 67. That's about it. Okay, great. Would you guys share your story with us today? Uh, I guess these two yahoos have elected me uh, to do this. This interview is to go back uh, to the interview I did in D.C. when they were supposed to be here. Uh, and we're going to go back and revisit uh, the 17th of January, 1967, when Charlie Company, 2nd Platoon, the heavy section, uh, at the time we were back at uh, the company headquarters, we normally operated at a 1-1, which was uh, about 10 clicks uh, out of that CP. We'd come back for resupply, uh, actually a hot shower, take the night, actually take our boots off. And around uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, roughly, uh, Everything broke loose. Uh, this particular location that Kilo 31 was in was only about uh, seven clicks away from us. Uh, we had been through that position several times, either dropping off supplies for them uh, as we would patrol the area, and so did the other platoons within Charlie Company First Tanks. Uh, upon the outbreak, uh, it was easy to see the red and green tracers down there, the mortars going off. Uh, the heavy section leader was Sergeant Barnett, uh, Sergeant Bart we used to call him. Uh, and he came into the hooch and said, everybody get on the tanks. Uh, we got out there, got cranked up, ready to go. And then we were held up, uh, what I believe was by an officer of uh, the Grunt Battalion. Uh, later I heard that he had told ba uh, Bart that uh, the battalion commander felt that was a diversionary attack and that there was gonna be attack on the main CP. Uh, at some point later, I don't know when that happened, some radio operator uh, approached Bart uh, and he was in contact with the guys that were getting overrun. Uh, Bart made the decision, or Sergeant Barnashevitz made the decision, let's go. Uh, all tanks moved out. Uh, we jumped back and forth over the uh, MSR, uh, <coughs> Eau Claire was the driver on our tank, Ed was the loader, I was the gunner, and uh, Sawcrant was the tank commander. Um, I had no idea as we jumped back and forth over the MSR that 54 tons of steel, you could actually be weightless in that tank. Uh, we slammed down pretty good a few times uh, as we got there. Uh, Sergeant Bart expected we might be ambushed on the way. Uh, I don't remember doing any return fire as we approached. Uh, once we got there from the gunner's seat, my view was all I could see was uh, obviously tracers uh, and explosions taking place uh, from my view at the tank. Uh, we were second tank uh, in the run down there. Uh, and uh, just listening on the comm helmet as uh, the discussion went on for, if it lasted 30 seconds, about the Constantino wire, whether we would dismount and try to open it and find the decision was made, we're going over it. Uh, any tanker knows that when you go over Constantino wire, there is a price to pay if it goes wrong. It'll get in the sprocket and off comes your track. And at that particular time of what was going on there, uh, 
all three tanks made it successfully across the wire. <coughs> Uh, to the best of my recollection, uh, Barnashevitz's tank went directly forward. Our tank went to the right, uh, commanded by Sawkrant, and Nally's tank, Corporal McNally's tank, went to the left. Uh, pretty much the direction was, uh, at that point in time, because of the entanglement of the Marines and the uh, uh, NBA and VC was a uh, not to use the main gun as a last, res use the main gun as a last resort. Use the 30, uh, if we had M14s, the submachine gun on the tank, and the sky mounts uh, to do whatever we could. Now, one thing unique to Charlie Company was that we had modified our tanks. Uh, we coaxed our 50 cal machine guns, uh, which were very effective at close range. Uh, and almost being able to snipe with it. Uh, under Sawcrant's orders, I was told to, uh, I was directed to fire at will, uh, and we directed fire. Uh, Eau Claire, uh was maneuvering the tank uh, and using his 45 because he was unable to button up due to the Marines uh, physically out of their holes fighting and the bodies on the ground. Uh, we, he wouldn't run over anybody. Uh, Ed, uh, the loader at the time, uh, kept me in plenty of ammo. Uh, and as we, as the fight continued, at some point, and I'm going to let Ed correct me if I'm wrong here, some grunt or somebody came over to the tank and told us that the listing pulse outside the wire uh, had wounded. Uh, and we tried, if I'm correct to get as close to the wire as possible. Um, and I think at that point, Roy gets off the tank. Well, you asked me for yeah. some magazines. Yeah. Got 45, the, yeah, go ahead. Got off the tank and I can't remember if there was a hole in the wire, if the wire was blown, but we went outside the CP or outside the wire to get the LP. There were four of them out there. Two of them were pretty badly wounded. So we, one of the other Marines and myself brought that one back, put him on the back of our tank, and then we went back outside the wire to pick up the second guy and bring him back and put him on the back of the tank. So we had them both secured on the back of the tank at that time. It, like I said, I don't remember if, if there was a hole in the wire, the wire was blown, but I, I know, I don't remember driving over the wire. I don't think Greg remembers no. driving over the uh. wire because there was, I remember there was a lot of wire out there, but I don't remember going through it. Yeah, I, I, I know, I know, Ed, you didn't, I didn't, I don't remember you having to go through the wire and you know, sneak through it. So there had to be a hole in it or else we drove straight across it, you know, so. Yeah. Uh -huh. Greatest driver, were you buttoned up? No, yeah. not at all. Uh, he had his head out the whole time. Uh, <clears throat> uh, half the time I had, uh, uh, like, a lot of old drivers did. They you know, kind of stood up in your, you know, and lean over the. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to make sure I didn't run over any Marines that were wounded or possibly dead. Uh, Ed says he remembers seeing some <clears throat> Charlie's uh, arms and legs go through the sprockets, you know. But uh, I, I know, I know for a fact uh, that I never ran over it even touched the Marines. So. By the time oh. by the time we got there were good getting to the far side of the compound where the, the wire was where we stopped, the VC had already been inside the perimeter and they were all over. We sh sh actually shot a couple of them off the tank trying yeah. to climb up. I know we shot some off of ours and the tanks after talking to them the next morning they had the same issue with them. Did and they were so Shot him off the pistols. The pistols. Pistols, yeah. yeah. I, I just know he kept asking me for magazines and I kept reloading them. Uh, the other thing I had to be careful of is because we had the coax 50. That 50 extended beyond the, the gun shield a good eight inches. So I, I could almost see him sometimes down in the gunner's seat if he was standing up or not. And uh, I guess I had to holler at you uh, to sit back down so I could fire the 50. Because uh, we we actually got there. They had kind of back up here. 
this patrol base was done, it was platoon patrol base, and, and Kilo 3-1 was being relieved that day by Mike 3-1. The helicopters brought uh, Mike in, but weren't able to take Kilo out. They were called off for emergency whatever. So both platoons were there that night. So I, I believe the count was, was roughly actually... about 105, I think, was the count of actual Marines there. And they that's were what hit by. Saved them as they had two platoons. Right. Uh, the VC thought it was one. Yeah. One platoon, and they they actually hit them. I think it was NBA. Battalion. I think it was Divi yeah, Div Battalion 70. Roughly, there was about 1,200 of them against about 105, 110 Marines, roughly. Uh, part of the problem was, and us going through there from a tanker's perspective. We always thought it was pretty lax. The wire was kind of half-ass. Uh, the jungle had grown in on that one side of the wire, and the bunkers weren't in the best repair. It was kind of considered like a little R and R thing for the grunts. Uh, and I have been able to get up to Camp Pendleton when these guys had a reunion up there. Just the overall, they put a monument, and I got to talk to a few of them. And they all say, yeah, if you guys hadn't shown up, there was no doubt that second wave, as they started in when you guys got there, that that hesitation in your firing made a huge difference because they still lost 17 Marines and had 33 wounded that night. And that attack just came so fast that, uh, uh, you know, I think I showed these pictures before, but this particular bunker the four Marines were in there, and the safeties were all on their rifles. They didn't even, uh, I mean, that, they got the zapper got in there that fast. Um, Stars and Stripes did a follow-up article to it. Uh, and I did try to contact uh, one of the lieutenants that was in the wire that night. Uh, I was able to meet with him at one of his officers' uh, reunions. Uh, initially, he told me he was willing to talk to me. I called him, uh, he said it was taken to a dark place, uh, he didn't want to discuss it. Uh, and when I called back uh, later, it was uh, his wife answered the phone and said, don't call here again. <laughs> uh, part, part of the reason we want to bring this out is the report, this is, this is the after action report that was actually written on that night. Uh, I was able to retype it, and the only thing they say is the tanks, the tanks accounted for about 40 kills. Nothing about the fact that we saved their butts or anything else. Uh, but I think the important thing here is that uh, the firepower that tanks bring to a battle, uh, our capability to suppress the enemy, and, you know, for this man to get off the tank with all hell breaking loose, for the drivers to be sticking their heads out there, uh, in the end, uh, there were uh, Silver Star given to John Barnashevich. Ed received a, a Bronze Star for his action. Uh, what was this driver's name? I forgot again. Uh, DeLuca. DeLuca, DeLuca uh, was given a Bronze Star. Uh, Barnett's, uh, I mean, Barnett's driver, driver. Uh, and pretty much what happened is uh, <clears throat> uh, the NBA thought the mess tent was the CP, and they set up the Russian 51 cal machine guns, 51 or 52 cal machine gun in there, and they were dinging off the Barnett's tank, and Deluca just gunned it and ran through the, knocked the tent, tent down. Um, and Nally also received the Bronze Star uh, for whatever he did on the left side. Uh, I don't know why Soccer didn't get anything, but anyway, um, anything you can think of there? No, it's just um, I mean, I kind of like half the, <coughs> as Rick was saying, about when they talked about uh, tanks being responsible for 40 kills. Uh, you know, we all know in our own, mind, our own minds that it was more than that. Uh, afterwards, the next day, <clears throat> when it got daylight, we went out and, 
uh, searched the area and we found this big mass grave that they <clears throat> they actually took meat hooks and were hauling off their dead and just hauling them out in the pile out there. Um, remember the bullet, they brought a dozer in and just buried them all there. And there had to be at least 500 bodies in that wow. that hole, you know. Did you ever um, use the 90? Say again? Did you ever use the 90 millimeter? No. And we, we never fired it. Mm -hmm. There was no way you could fire the 90 in there. Yeah, yeah I mean, we were right too in Too close it. for the 90. Yeah. Yeah, if, you, if we'd have fired a 90, we'd have, you know, any Marine that was uh, wounded or still in the fight, it, it would have been yeah. pre pretty bad to do yeah. that. Uh, we stayed all, all night there uh, and secured it. Uh, none of us really slept. Uh, no, because all you could hear was choppers coming yeah, in. Yeah, just choppers coming and a lot, a lot going on. Uh, uh, we knew there was movement out in front of us, uh, but uh, Barnashevitz had to, as a single tank, actually leave the battle because the grunts coming down on the Amtrak's got lost. I mean, you know, talking seven clicks away, I don't know they got lost, but he had to go back out the wire by himself and bring them in. And they did dismount them, and then there was no real clear guidance where in fact they were. So even though there was some movement out there, we, we didn't fire, we held, we held everything. Uh, having been in the tank uh, a long time, and I actually remember being in the canteen because we couldn't get out of the tank. And then Sawcrant let us on the ground the next morning and on the right rear by the sprocket, mm -hmm. he and I are looking at this very large VC laying on the ground shot in the leg yeah and i can't remember if we kicked him no I, I, actually we were going to do something else no, I, I think we were going to yeah, yeah something but, else uh, take but anyway he moved <laughs> yeah. this guy moved moved and, and stood and, up yeah. and when, and we, oh, when he stood him up he was probably six foot tall and outweighed me by a hundred pounds you know oh. so he was That's definitely a, yeah he was definitely a, a, a chinese guy you know yeah so. Yeah, and we, I was going to grease him, but uh, Grunt said no, and, and they hauled him off. And I don't know how long he lived after that, you know. But uh, were you buttoned up all night? No, no, we were on. We were no, on we, button, uh, we never we were, buttoned up the whole time. Yeah, we were uh, wide awake, uh, making sure that we weren't going to get a hit again, you know. We, so we had, we'd start the tank every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously scan the area with the Z on searchlight, uh, looking for any movement out there. Uh, we do that. Uh, one thing to add to the POW is that he, he spoke very good English. He did. It was amazing. He stood up and he, I think he said, am I supposed to say Chew Hoy? Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we got the word later, uh, well actually it was after the information he was able to give to Intel uh, resulted in Operation Stone which kicked off like two days later. Yeah. And if you read the follow up to that operation, we, we knocked out a couple hundred of them. They were just, had come down. <clears throat> I think he said, uh, I read later, where he said uh, it took them about four months to infiltrate that far south. Uh, and he was actually being educated at BYU. Yep. And he no longer was hearing from his parents that lived in the north. So he managed to get back in. And of course, he was inscripted immediately into the NBA. And, uh, came down with them and uh, once he was shot he figured he was just going to stay there and hope the tank we didn't we didn't we didn't move he just laid there all night and like i said it was a good thing in those days we weren't wearing skivvies when he yeah. stood up because it yeah. definitely got the adrenaline going but his intel led to finding the rest of his division and almost wiping them out because if i'm correct uh nba but that battalion, I think it was NBA something 70, never reappeared in, in South Vietnam again. So we must have definitely put a dent in their, in their, in their armor. Uh, anything else you can think of? Yeah, I remember <coughs> the, the flare ship stayed on station mm -hmm. with us all night. And yeah. I remember Puff working in the, in the distance. After they pulled back and things were quiet, and every once in a while you'd see the red stream out of him yeah. open up on something. That's a great sight. It was. Puff would open up. And yeah. Just... yeah. And then I think <clears throat> they kept us there till almost dusk the next day. Yeah. And if I'm correct, 
Roy drives the tank. I'm driving back. You're in the loader's hatch, yeah. and I'm sitting outside. And he hits a mine. Hit and he hits line. a mine. <clears throat> and I get knocked get, off. Yeah, I, was gonna say. I get knocked off the tank. I can't hear squad. Everybody's hollering. And that's why I have hearing aids today. <laughs> and the blood's coming out my right ear. And I thought I knew what was going on. All I remember is I'm on top of an Amtrak. <laughs> it's like, how did I get here? And in the distance, I can see the tanks as they're disappearing. I'm on these Amtraks going back to Battalion Med. And I won't get off the tracks, but the grunts are holding me down. And we got back in the CP. I went in and saw Doc. He looks at me, he gives me two ACPs and says, go hit the rack. <laughs> <laughs> so much for concussion checking out, you know. Uh, and then uh, I remember you guys rolling in uh, a couple hours later after you got the track buttoned up. And uh, so you had you basically had two man crew coming up. Uh, well, three, three, three. three, three, three was uh, yeah. soccer. And, I didn't and let him drive no more. Yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't either. He told me I broke his tank to stay on the driver's edge. Yeah, I mean. Did you hit any mines other than? Uh, no, yeah. I think I hit what we hit, hit two or two three. Or three, yeah, yeah. In our time there, we yeah you know, definitely ran over. That was, that was one thing about down south was uh, the mines and the booby traps took its toll. Uh, we had some counterplays. One of the, one of the neat things, Gunny Jones, he, he could always think outside the box. He actually would have us take the rounds apart, and we would pack them with C4. And as we traveled between 1-1 one, one and 3-1, and we would, we would randomly just throw rounds out. And every once in a while, we'd hear the boom, and we'd go check it out. And sure enough, the, it, it blew the receiver up of an AK-47 or an SKS, and there'd be our dead NBA or VC. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of funny, but uh, the, the coax machine gun was, was really a godsend for us down there because uh, Unlike up north, where you got bombarded and a few other things, uh, we it was not unusual for us to go out 15, 20, 30 days and sit with the grunts rotating, but us not. Our fuel yeah. being flowing in, breaking out cases of ammo in the field, uh, that was not unusual, and not even seeing the light section. Yeah. I mean, we worked with 1-1 one, one for well, we were together almost nine months yeah, together on yeah. tank. Right at nine months. And we, and we just lived out at 1-1. One, one. We just had a tent. The lieutenant used to come out there, and we had a comm guy, and that was it. It was just the three tanks. And uh, the, the uniqueness of the 50 being coax was that a lot of times the tree line was almost too close to fire AG and yet just far enough where the canister wouldn't be effective. But be able to put that 50 out there was extremely effective and then Gunny Jones was at him about bore sighting and zeroing everything well he figured out we could actually bore sight and zero the 50 with the pair with the periscope not the telescope and we kept that for right telescope periscope yeah and uh, we kept that for the 90 but it was almost like sniping with that 50 I mean it was that accurate well when we when we say well, it wasn't the regular 50s that the tanks had. We had aircraft 50s. Oh, okay. oh, and, yeah. and, you know, they'd shoot 1,200 rounds a minute. Yeah. And they, we emptied out so fast, we had to take uh, our water cans and cut the tops off them, and we loaded them up with belts of okay, uh, yeah. And I mean, they'd go through a water can just like that, you know. But you know, the, the, the That's why I wear hearing aids, yeah, too. Yeah, that, that, that ready <laughs> rack. You had right there uh, by the loader. Yeah. We just bolted, cut off the water cans and bolted them on there. Yeah. And then he would just put the ammo in there. I, th I think though, we did switch back to our 50s after a while, which that were a, long a slower rate of fire, but still a good rate because it just got, we, we chinked so much brass into the turret. Sometimes we get jammed up traversing. Yeah. So, but once we, I think once we switched yeah. back to the other 50, our, our standard 50, it was good and then the, 30 was up on top, and I think even later, some of the guys even put him 60s up there. So. Yeah. I know we were sitting in a blocking position one time, and I, I remember Rick picking off a, 
uh, uh, Charlie uh, about 2,000 meters away with the 50. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah 50. I mean, it was. It was literally like sniping with a 50. Yeah, yeah. The 50 I mean, it was great. Reach out and touch them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and and I, the reason we know we got him because it was the tracer round yeah. that got him, you know. Yeah. So, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Rick, Rick cranked off some bursts, and then when we were watching the tracers, and this one tracer round is the one that got him. That's I mean, it would. It, we could pick up. You know, uh, the thing would be is that you know the uh, typically grunts. You know, it's like one one thing. I think the Marine Corps kind of slacked as we as we brought replacements in. We lost that cohesiveness of tank infantry coordination, and there'd be times we'd be sweeping, and the grunts would get a, ahead of us and on the sides of us, which limited sometimes our maneuverability and our ability to fire the 90. Uh, and then when we would get gunfire, sometimes we were reconnaissance by gunfire, and sure enough, because the enemy didn't have fire discipline, they would fire back. And with our, the magnification of our scopes, we could actually, I mean, you could see them as close as you're sitting here with those 10 power scopes, and that 50 was tremendous for doing that. It really was. You know, you know the only thing I, I, I got left to say <laughs> is that you know, the night that we went out there and bailed out the grunts, uh, that, uh, you know, I, I, I know the feeling now of, <clears throat> I guess the adrenaline comes out, because you, you're not scared when you're going in there. Yeah. Uh, you're not scared until after it's all over and it gets quiet, yeah. you know. And uh, I just, I, I really feel that was, I, I was blessed that, that I was there at that time and that, uh, you know, I, that's the closest I've probably come to being maybe extinguished, you know. But uh, my heart goes out to them guys that were up there, up farther up north in Quezon and, uh, and all that stuff. And uh, guys, and as I said, uh, I met a guy yesterday um, that was on Operation Starlight. And, Jerry. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jerry Hearn, I think his name is. And uh, I was, I said, so you were saying, uh, Starlight, and he says, yeah, and I said, did you ever know a guy named Vickery? And his face just drained, and and he said, that was my tank commander. And uh, so I, I met him going through this Vickery, going through staging battalion on my way over back over. And uh, I don't know whatever happened to him after that, but I know the story, and I, I know the story about how two tanks were escorting five Amtraks, and they, they got tore apart yeah. and uh, got him. I don't know whether Vickery, I asked him, I said, do you remember what his name was? And he said, Corporal, <laughs> first name, you know? And, and I said, well, he was, he changed his name when I met him, he was Sergeant. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, like I said, I, you know, you guys that were in third tanks up in uh, uh, where the, during the Tet and stuff, you know, got an, uh, my heart goes out to you guys, you know? I feel blessed I wasn't there, you know, so. Well, you, you guys were in plenty of action. Yeah. 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 Well, you know what's interesting is, is, you know, reading Jim's book, reading Bob's, even your other books, it's, it's like, well, we were already there. Yeah. You know, we, we were there and we did this. And you guys had to go back and you just read that vicious cycle we yeah. were all in. Yeah. You know, regardless of what year, you know, yeah. uh, going to the island, on the bridges, uh, sinking tanks, uh, all, all this, you know, taking this hill, this position, over and over again. And it just went on for, you know, the five years that tanks were in country. It just, yeah, yeah it's, but you know, we did our job. We were Marines, we did our job. You know, and after Vietnam, it, it was probably 10 years before I told my wife that it was this guy's fault that I went to Vietnam, you know, so. He tells that story often, by the way. And that's a true story, too. Yeah. So. Well, we really appreciate you guys right. and, and all that you did and, and all you're doing for the organization yeah. because these stories are going to be out there for generations to see and those, those people who couldn't understand why we were doing what we were doing will hear stories like these to understand how brave all you guys were and what we did was for the right reasons. Well, you, you know, uh, one thing that I see too is is that, you know, back in our day, you know, everybody's day, that, you know, we didn't get that recognition when we came home, you know, but we're getting it now, finally. 
and that, that's probably because of the Desert Storm guys and that. Yeah. Uh, even what I see, even young kids, uh, they're not being put up to it by their parents. They're, I don't know if they're learning it in school or what, but uh, I have a lot of young kids that come up and thank you for serving, you know, so we got to keep that going too. We do. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Just real okay. quick okay. to let you know, uh, unfortunately, this one and I kind of joined at the hip here. I am. Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we went to boot camp together, ITS, tank school, and then. Uh, How'd you miss out? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know. He, he was smart. He was a smart, <laughs> he was a smart one. <laughs> so he hooked up with us a little bit later. Uh, actually, we started off with Sergeant Maddox. Jerry's yeah. here. Uh, I wrote that article. Yeah. You can't shoot our tank commander and get away with it. So, yeah. And then uh, Roy joined us, I think, right after that, right? Yeah. Yeah. He came on board. By the way, he retired as a Sergeant Major. Yeah. Oh, really? He stayed yes, in reserve and retired as a Sergeant Major. Yeah. Wow. Actually got into the Gulf War. All three of you? Uh, first Sergeant, First Sergeant, Sergeant Major. Mm -hmm. uh, the backbone of the Corps. Yeah. So. yeah, speaking um, of coming home, coming home from Desert Storm was completely different from coming home from Vietnam. Oh, yeah. 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 Imagine.